Let's all stand up and welcome Marcella Barcelona to the stage. That was an incredible introduction. Thank you, Zoe. Um, I love the name Zoe. Guys, I'm here with my incredible, good-looking husband who's right there. Can you stand up for me? Just stand up, stand up. There you go. This is Brian. And uh, we have three beautiful little ones at home. And we haven't publicly announced it, but we're actually expecting one more in here. So we have four little ones. Um, but our firstborn is, her name is Zoe. So when I found out her name was Zoe, I was like, I have a Zoe. So I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old at home. Um, and there's a couple people with us tonight that's part of our team. Can you guys stand? if you're part of our One Voice crew. This is some of our, our missionary team that loves Jesus and gives their lives every day, seriously. Um, guys, I'm so honored to be here. I'm so honored um, standing here. There is so much history in 50 years. You know, I think about people that have been here and I'm like, wow. Like, Carrie Job, right, was here. Um, my spiritual dad, who came from Mexico, came here um, and uh, graduated from here. And now he's in Los Angeles. And he's an incredible spiritual father. He's been my spiritual father for 15 years. And he graduated from here. So there's a lot of history with God and with people here, so I'm just really honored and humbled to be here with you guys. Um, but when I was asking the Lord what he wanted me to share with you, uh, he was really specific about wanting to share his heart on friendship and fellowship. And he, he really wants to talk about intimacy and friendship and fellowship. And, you know, I know you guys had the Millers here who are now our pastors, Michael and Larissa Miller from Upper Room. And I heard it was amazing. How, how many of you guys enjoyed Michael and Larissa Miller? It was amazing. And so the fact that I got to be here tonight on your encounter night, I was asking the Lord, why are you sending me on encounter night? And I felt like he said he wanted to encounter us tonight. And I'm going to say us because he wants to encounter me too. So he wants to encounter us tonight. But what he's looking for is childlike faith. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about childlike faith. And I want you to go to Luke 18, 17. Luke 18, 17 says this, I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. This is really like, I feel like he's giving us the key, right? He's saying, you want to enter my kingdom, you have to become like a child. That means, have you been around children? Children are the best. I actually really love to be around children. You're either like having celebratory time or you're frustrated and you don't know what to do and you don't know how to speak to them sometimes because they really are in wonder. Like they really, they're not stuffy. They're not serious, okay? Um, and they ask questions in the moments that maybe you have no answers for. Is that true? So can we get rid of stuffy and serious in the room? I feel like the Lord is doing something so beautiful right now. He's preparing his bride. And he's taking off old, wretched, raggedy garments. And he's putting on his garments of praise and his garments of righteousness. So can we take off our filthy rags of being serious and stuffy and professional? Can we connect with him tonight? How many of you guys want to connect with him tonight? Okay. 
So it really, really matters. What matters is connection. And how many of you, when you think about, man, childlike faith, being like a child, it's kind of foreign. Because we're in a world that is loaded with information, loaded with so much that makes you think or believe that you know when you really have no idea. And so you walk around thinking that you know something, but you actually really don't know. You know, I was standing right there when you, were, you guys were in worship, and I was reminded of a dream I had in 2012, I was in LA, I'm, I, I'm Salvadorian, I was born in El Salvador, but I was, how many, how many Latinos do we have in here? <laughs> oh, I love that. I'm Latina, I'm Salvadorian, I'm Central American. Um, and I ended up in Los Angeles, California. But I was running with a man named Lou Ingo. How many of you guys know Lou Ingo? He's a papa for me and my husband. And I was running with him on the life message, on being a voice for the ending of abortion. And in 2012, I had a significant dream. I was um, at my parents' house, and I remember waking up and seeing a many, many women, and they were all asleep around me. And I remember in the dream just coming out and wrestling to wake up. But when I woke up, I was so excited that I was awake. And I remember walking into the other room, and I saw women on the ground, and I saw this white woman, and she was wrestling to wake up. And I heard the Holy Spirit tell me in the dream, shout and say, wake up. Wake up, wake up. And I start shouting and I'm like, wake up, wake up, wake up. And she comes out and she wakes up. And she says, I'm awake. And I said, you are, we gotta go. And so we start running to the front of the door. I remember seeing this older man there and the older man says with joy on his face, you're awake, look up. And all of a sudden I look up at the clouds and I see the clouds tearing apart and I know that Jesus is coming back and I'm awake. And I had so much joy in my heart because I was awake. And I felt, I, I was asking the Lord, why that dream that you're presenting it to me as I'm standing here in worship? I believe that the Lord wants to wake you up tonight. I, I, I pondered on that dream for many years. Do you guys have dreams that you've pondered on that you know are significant and you're just like, what does this all mean? And so at first I thought it has to do with women, right? Because there was women everywhere. And then, have, do you guys know who de Havilland Ford is? Then I heard de Havilland Ford had a dream in 2016 or 17 and it was about all these women in the Lincoln Memorial and they were turning into horses in the verses, Psalm 68, 11, where it says that the word of the Lord will come to a company of women and the women will host the word of the Lord. And then she said that this company of women went into the, to the undergrounds of what, what the Lincoln Memorial was. And in the underground, she found women in burkas. You guys heard this dream before? And the women in burkas were waiting for the Western women to come so that Acts 2 would happen over the East and the West. Guys, this is significant. I know that you guys stand for the nations. I feel like right now the West is waking up to the East. And the East is significant in this hour. And so as I was listening to de Havilland's dream, I felt the Lord say, Marcella, that wasn't about women. That was about my church. And you were shouting at her, wake up, wake up, wake up. And she woke up and it was time. And it was time to look up and see that the king of glory was returning. 
I just want to, I want to say this to you. You are the generation that God wants to prepare for the returning of the king. I don't know, does this excite you? I mean, what is it all on to? It's all on to him and his return. It's all on to meeting. But we don't have to wait until that day. We can meet him now. We can encounter him daily. We can. I'm sorry, and you know, one of my four-year-olds like, I can't say I'm sorry. It's hard. You know, and I'm like, I know it's hard. She's struggling to say she's sorry, right? And then when she's like, Can you help me? I'm like, I'm sorry. And she's like, I'm sorry. And then she's like freed and liberated. Is that some of us? Man, I'll tell you something. My, my children, I feel like, you know, the Lord says that we're, we form them, but they actually form us. And I learn so much daily just by looking at them and just by watching their innocence watching the purity of their heart. And I believe that the Lord wants to restore that in you. I believe that the Lord wants to restore childlike faith and innocence again to the bride. He wants to restore childlike faith. And I, I, I want to share a little bit about my story. I was five years old. I, I was raised, my parents are pastors. I, I was raised in the church. I was very Pentecostal. Latin America church, you know, I remember being five years old and just praising and worshiping in, on the altars. And I, I had a fever and my mom brought me to church. You know, I was five years old and she says, you're getting ready. We're going to church. God's going to heal you. I remember being five years old and I, I was feeling sick and I felt something pull me in, onto the altar. And I just started dancing like you did earlier which that was amazing, Pastor. I started dancing, and all of a sudden, I felt the Spirit of the Lord come on me, and I was five. And I just started weeping and weeping, and I knew it was God. And all of a sudden, my fever had broken, was gone. And I remember coming to my mom and saying, you were right, like, I'm healed. You know, but after a long journey of being in the church, I was really hurt, and so were my parents, and we actually became a prodigal family, and I was 12 years old when I left the Lord. Isn't that wild? After these encounters with the Lord, you can still leave the Lord. No one is exempt from falling away. It's his mercy and his grace that keeps us. And so I... I left the Lord when I was 12 years old and I became a prodigal. How many of you guys have read the, the, the parable of the prodigal? And I had a long journey of returning back home. I really did. I was the last one out of all of us to come back home. I remember being in the world and I remember thinking, I don't think I'll ever go back. But I knew that it was death, and I knew that I would die. And I was 20 years old, and I was in a university. I was at Cal State Northridge University getting a bachelor's in, you know, criminal justice. I want to be an attorney. I wanted to put bad guys in jail. I had a very, I had a zeal for justice. And I felt like the Lord had always done that since I was a child. I just, everything the enemy had Dolan, he had destroyed and taken from me. And now he was equipping me for his army. And I was 20 years old and I came to college and got involved in a lot of things. And I remember being indoctrinated with, you know, the feminist movement. And I'm going to get a little vulnerable. You know, I got... I got pregnant at 20 years old. And I remember thinking, there's no way I could ever be mother. Isn't it interesting 
how Satan also knows in a way your greatest calling, but he distorts it and he attacks it. And at 20 years old, he attacked my womb. The very thing that I was designed to be was mother. And that was the very thing he came after at 20 years old. How many 20 year olds do I have here in the room? It's awesome. And I remember just being lost and being broken and feeling death. Guys, it was the worst decision. And I, I, I just spiraled into depression, suicidal thoughts. And my parents were Christians. And I remember my mother praying in intercession in my room. And I would come home from school and she was in my room praying and she would declare identity over me even though she saw where I was. She said, this is not who you are. You were formed and framed in my womb. And I know that you're he, she would quote Jeremiah 1, 4, you're a prophet to the nations and God's going to use you one day. And I was just like, mom, you have no idea. But I remember coming to an encounter, a youth retreat in Los Angeles. And I came and I was desperate. I was like, listen, I've ate with pigs. I know what it's like to be in the depths of darkness. Jesus, if you're real, I really need to find you. And I remember being in this retreat and I ran out because the presence of God was so strong. And you know, when there's darkness in your heart, how many of you guys have watched The Chosen? If you haven't watched The Chosen, you need to watch The Chosen. But that Mary Magdalene scene of when there's darkness in your heart, darkness really does flee from the light. And I remember just feeling these tremblings in the room and I walked out and this little Guatemalan lady ran after me and she said, stop. And my whole body just stopped. And she ran to me and all I remember is that I felt the same presence that I had felt when I was five years old. And I saw these eyes that were full of mercy, filled with kindness. And all he said was, I forgive you. And his forgiveness saved me. You know, when Leonard Ravenhouse said that he came not to make bad men good, but to bring dead men to life. Jesus came not to make you good, but so that you would live. And that day my heart started to beat again and he welcomed me into the kingdom, just like the prodigal. And he didn't have anything to say, but robed me in righteousness and innocence and childlike faith. And I remember running into that room with a whole bunch of 16 and 17 year olds and I was 23 at the time and I started to dance and there was no shame in dancing. I didn't care what anyone thought. I had full permission to love him back. You have full permission to love him. You know, I remember being called the overly saved girl. Oh God, Marcel, you're just overly saved. Yes, I know you're gonna tell me about the Bible again. And I thought, is there something wrong with me? Like, I was like, I, I just met him. <laughs> and I can't stop talking about him. Because I saw him and I'm now alive. So guess what? I didn't care. You heard about the Samaritan woman that meets him at the well in John 4? And all of a sudden, 
She finds herself before the Messiah who's presenting himself to her as the Messiah for the first time. And he's giving her this eternal water to drink from. And she comes out and tells the whole city about her encounter with Jesus. And they're saved. But you know what's interesting in the prodigal son story? You know the older brother? Gets really jealous, huh? And he's just like, wait, wait, wait. I've been here. I've done the job. I'm the professional Christian. What do you mean you're bringing him in? What do you mean you're giving him everything? I've done the work. You know, Jesus recently showed me that he came to destroy the image of the older brother. Do you know why? Because Jesus is the older brother. Jesus is our older brother. And he redeemed that. And he's the older brother that brings us in with celebration. And he's the one that says, come on in, you're broken. I love you. Come on in, you don't know. You, you don't know. I love that you don't know. Our father has everything for us. He celebrates. He praises. A child celebrates. They praise. Right? Guys, we gotta get real. Vulnerability. In order to have fellowship and friendship with Jesus, you need vulnerability. I know it's awkward. I know we don't like it. It's uncomfortable. But Jesus taught us vulnerability. And vulnerability is very different. Fellowship and friendship is very, I, I think I heard Billy Humphrey say this. Fellowship and friendship is very different than community. Community, you're at, you're, you, you could do it in a bowling alley. You go and you bowl. You go and you watch a movie and there's no connection. Why? Because you weren't vulnerable. And your friend wasn't vulnerable with you either. But have you ever been in a conflict with someone that you love? And all of a sudden you have to get vulnerable? And you're vulnerable and you're kind of nervous because you're just like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what he's going to say. When you're married, this happens a lot. Conflict isn't bad, okay? Conflict is actually really good. It's two storms coming together, creating the perfect storm. And you're, you're in conflict and you start getting vulnerable. And then the other person starts getting vulnerable too. And then it gets really kind of nerve-wracking because you're just like, where do we go from here? And that's what Ecclesiastes 3 says. A cord of three strands isn't easily broken. Every relationship that you have needs the living God as the cord that holds it together. So when two are broken and they join, they say, Jesus, what are you saying right now? And he comes and he restores and he reconciles. And it's so interesting that we serve a Godhead. He's three in one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, what are they having? They're not having community, guys. They're having fellowship. They're having friendship. The Holy Spirit witnesses Jesus. Jesus witnesses the Father. The Father witnesses Jesus. And it's a strand that keeps going and going and going. And if we were created in the likeness and in the image of this Godhead, what are we doing? If we're saying, come on, holy, I like the shoelace. The, the shoe, Danielle did a great job with the shoelace. But if we're saying, Holy Spirit, tighten us. Holy Spirit, knit us. With Jesus, witness Jesus. Then the Holy Spirit will start working in you, but it looks like something. It looks like fellowship. It looks like friendship. 
He could have came and did it all himself, but he wanted you in, in the story. He wanted you to know the story. He wanted to do it with you. Guys, vulnerability is so important. It's so key. And I just want to get rid of any condemnation in the room. Because I could kind of feel it in the room. And I want, to, I want to share this scripture with you. Ephesians 2.13 says this. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Let me say that again. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off. How many of us are far off? Raise your hand. Come on, guys. Let's get honest. It says you've been brought near, not by your works, not by what you've done, not by how good you sing, not by how good you preach, but by the blood of the Lamb. That is why the Father draws near to you. It's because he says, oh, there's my son. There's Jesus. And all of a sudden you feel the father and it's because of the blood. Revelation 12, 11 says you've overcome not by your works, not by anything you think that you've done, but by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Your testimony is important. You don't have to have a testimony like mine. You can have your testimony. And it can look completely different. But it's still a work of God. It's a masterpiece. It's a testimony of Christ. So can we get rid of the accusation and the condemnation that comes over us of Satan telling us you didn't do it right? Could it, you, you were off key. Didn't sound right. You didn't get the applause you thought. Are you sure the presence of God came? That is not your responsibility. That is the blood. That is Jesus. He's the one that enters in. And brings the presence of the Father. So it's not in our works. You know, I know, I, I love, there was a, a thing that Michael said about. God is really looking for followers, guys. He's really looking for friends. He's looking for those that are, wi are, are willing to go into a place of prayer and live in the secret. And let him build you on the inside. So that you can build what he wants to build. His kingdom. He's looking for the faithful. Not the influential. Not the sensational. Not the fascinating. He's looking for the faithful. It's not about your personality, whether you're introverted, whether you're extroverted, whether you're an Enneagram 1 or you're an Enneagram 9 or you're an Enneagram 7. He's looking for faithful. He's looking for friends. He's looking for friends. I just, you know, I recently I've, I was really sick. <laughs> with this baby and I, I, I woke up one morning and I, I was just like, God, I, I really need you to speak to me. I wanna give you guys a key. When you, you come into the secret place, can you just sit with him? And then let him, op just open your Bibles and let him begin to tell you what he says you are. There is something about when your Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit speak to you that begins to destroy every work of Satan, every accusation, every thought that comes against you, every work of the flesh. 
when you let him start speaking truth into you, you're gonna be so amazed. And so I, this is my routine. I come before the Father and I say, Father, I need to hear your voice. Speak to me. Remind me. Lavish me with your love. It doesn't get old, guys. It's new every single day. I'm in need of his love every single day, every single hour, it feels like, every single second. And so it's so interesting, but that morning, he said, I want you to open a Psalm 139. I open it, and I, of course, you know, it's like those, those chapters or those scriptures, you're just like, I know this one. You know, and I'm kind of like, we're going there, okay. You know what the secret builds in you? Identity. You come to know what he says of you, and you become secure in what your father says of you. And this is what he said. Psalm 139. This is for you formed my inward parts. You kneaded me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in the secret. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Guys, do you notice that he formed us in the secret? The Father formed you in secret. And that morning, I just started weeping when I started thinking. You, you, you got, you who are surrounded by a storm of angels and wonders in heaven. You brought me into the secret and you began to form my frame. And it did something to my heart. It tenderized my heart as I began to think of how detailed and intricate the Father is about who we are. And I saw this, these, these DNA strands start coming out of his heart. And he was forming me with his heart. And I just started weeping and he said, I formed you with my heart. You carry my heartbeat. And instantly I was just like, I'm sorry. And he was kind of like, what are you saying sorry for? I was just like, I'm just sorry. I love you. And it's those moments of connection that you don't forget. And guys, it doesn't happen here. Moments happen here corporately that are amazing. But you have to get into the secret place. You have to know him. You have to know his voice. His words to you. What are they doing? What are they saying? Because that's what a friend does, right? A friend is intimate with each other. You go out with your friend. You want to talk to them. You take them out alone. You want to get to know them. Same with Jesus. That's why he said in the Sermon on the Mount, shut the door of your room. Go in and know me in secret. That was a commandment. Like he wants us to know him in secret. Why? Because he formed us in secret. He formed us in the darkness. I, I'm thinking right now, my, this unborn baby is in darkness in my womb. And that's where this baby's being formed. Many of the time, we think that we're going to be formed in the spotlight. Oh, I'm probably going to be formed here on the platform. Or I'm going to be formed, you know, I don't know. I, he's saying, no, I want to form you in the secret. Go where no one sees you. Go where you're alone with me. In the places where you feel like, why is this so dark? Why does it feel this way, God? I, I, I mean, I, I'm not influential. I'm not, I don't even know if I'm changing anybody. But he's like, don't worry about that. 
I'm forming you. Let me form you. Let me form you in the hidden places. He wants that friendship. He wants that fellowship. I want to I wanna talk about, and this is how I want, I want to end. But I want to I wanna talk about vulnerability opening the door to intimacy and friendship. And a great person that shows us this is Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany was Jesus' friend. That's so wild. Because he would constantly go to Lazarus' house when Mary and Martha were. He would go to Bethany. Why? Because they were his friends. And so John 12, 18 says, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served. And then it goes on and talks about Mary. And it talks about her coming to Jesus. In a moment, she understood the times and the seasons of her friend. She understood that he was needing to be prepared for burial. She understood that Jesus was about to go to a cross. Where none of the disciples understood that. She understood that. What does she do? She breaks this alabaster jar, this fragrance, which was all that she had. And she breaks it before him. Can you imagine what he smelled like? Can you imagine the fragrance that was on him? Can you imagine the, what the disciples were saying? What others were saying? I mean, in the scripture, it says that Judas was like, what are you doing? Why are you wasting this? This is for the poor. And Jesus says she understood something. The poor will always be here, but I will not always be here. She understood that she could pour out herself in abandonment because he wasn't always going to be there. Her friend was about to depart and she knew that she had to give it all before he went. She was his friend. And in the most vulnerable moment, can you imagine, guys, Jesus was in the flesh. I mean, you know that song that says, Oh God, he became a man. He took on flesh, right? You're so beautiful. I think John, Thur oh, who sings that song? Justin Rizzo, that's old IHOP. Okay, it says, there's one found worthy, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it says, oh God, you became a man. You took on flesh. You're so beautiful. That gets me. It's Philippians 2. He left the glory of God to become a man. He was in the flesh. Probably one of the most vulnerable moments. He was going to go onto the cross. He was going to go and suffer. He was going to go and die. And here is his friend breaking it all in vulnerability and saying, you can have it all. I'm going to prepare you. You can have it all. Isn't it interesting, though, that Judas didn't understand this? Right? His heart had lost intimacy and friendship. He was blind. He could not see beyond the own greed of his heart. Greed had invaded his heart. And he had lost the intimacy and the friendship with Jesus. And Mary of Bethany kept it. And you know what's amazing? You keep going and you see in John 13, Jesus does the biggest display of friendship. He gets on his knees and he starts washing the disciples' feet. The very men who were going to leave him, the very men who were going to betray him, the very men who were going to, you know, deny him. 
He begins to wash their feet. What a display of servanthood and friendship. And then this is what he says in John 15, 15. He says, no longer do I call you slaves. For the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. Are you ready to become his friend? You're not a slave. And I feel like in, in this hour, I, I'm believing. Guys, I'm believing. You know, it's so interesting, but you look at the Garden of Gethsemane and he only had three there. What if this is the generation that actually says yes to what those three said to, yes to? I mean, even though they fell asleep, but now they, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. And even in moments when we fall asleep, guess what? We can wake up. We can wake up and we can be faithful to our friend because he's so faithful to us. He's the most faithful. The only reason that we're faithful is because he's faithful to us. What if we can believe like children and say, there will be hundreds and hundreds and thousands of friends that you're going to have in our generation? What if Gen Z is the generation of friends? What if Gen Z is the one that says, I will say yes to the cost of following you? I will pick up my cross. I will deny myself. I will follow you unto the end. I won't care about my reputation. I won't care about my influence. I just have to know you. I have to know you and I have to know that you know me. That I'm your friend. Guys, as a millennial, I can tell you, I've seen so many of my friends fall away. And it hurts my heart. And I'm like, man, Jesus, this road is really narrow. And he says, yeah, it is, but have hope, Marcella. Have hope. Because I'm bringing an awakening that no man can stop. That Satan can't stop. And so many are going to return. But how are we going to receive them? We need to be formed into the image of Christ. Guys, he's the reward. He's the reward. Jesus is the reward. Can you stand? Oh, Father, we thank you, Lord. There where you are, why don't you just close your eyes. I just want you to focus on Jesus. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're so faithful to witness the Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're the one that gives us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a tender heart to receive him. And so Holy Spirit, I just ask right now, like a wave, would you just come and touch everyone here? Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. We just pray, Jesus. Jesus, would you encounter us tonight? Jesus, I just ask right now, Lord, that 
every mind right now, every thought would be taken captive to the knowledge of who you are. That every false idea, every false ideology would fall to the ground in Jesus' name. And I pray right now just for faith in the room where there's been doubt, where there's been unbelief. Right now, I just speak faith in the room, childlike faith to believe. If that's you, if you've been struggling with doubt and unbelief, can you come up? I believe the Lord is just gonna, it's like an arrow. He's just gonna pierce you with faith to believe, to believe. You're gonna believe like a child. Everything he says, you're just going to say, I'll do it. I'll go. When he says jump, you jump. When he says sit, you sit. When he says go, you go. And it'll be the faith. It'll be this faith, this, this awakening of faith. Yeah, Father, we thank you right now for faith. Thank you, God, for faith to believe. For faith to believe in the things that we cannot see. But Jesus, we know you're at work. And so right now, God, rid us of unbelief. Rid us of doubt, God. Give us childlike faith. Give us childlike faith. Lord, I just ask for ears to be open, to hear him through his word. God, in moments in the secret, God, would they come to know you in that place? Would you release glory in the secret where they are with you? Just want to make another calling. If you've been struggling to get to the secret place, this is being vulnerable, okay? I feel like there's breakthrough for you today. You're going to get in there. And you're going to get to know them. And if that's you, I want you to come up. If that's you and you're... You've been feeling like, oh, it's so hard to get there. But I know that's where I belong. He's bringing you home. He's bringing you to the secret, to the unseen, where no one sees you, but he sees you. And there's eternal rewards there. Heaven's there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you love the secret. Thank you, God, that you love the unseen. When nobody sees, you see. Thank you, God. Thank you for a generation that will live in the secret place. Thank you, God, that they're going to buy the gold. They're going to have the oil. They're going to live from that place. Thank you, Jesus. Just one last thing. If you're saying tonight, I want to be a friend. I want to be his friend. Yes, I want to follow him unto the end. But I want to be his friend. I want to know him. I want to know what the Father's saying. I want to be in the Trinitarian dialogue. What are they saying? What are you doing? I want to be your friend. If that's you, can you come up? If you're saying, I want to be his friend. I want to be his friend. And 
just like Mary and Bethany, you're saying, I, I'm going to give it all. I'm going to prepare. You know what you're preparing for? You're preparing the way of the Lord. Because he's coming back. And he's looking for friends to prepare his return. He's looking for a bride that's making herself ready. Pure and spotless that's saying, I'm your friend. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait. Because you're coming for me. If that's you and you're saying, I want friendship. I want to go in knowing I'm going to give it all. I'm going to give it all. I'm going to be your friend. Can you just lift your hands? If you're saying yes to friendship, I just want to pray for you. Just lift your hands. There you go. God, Father, I thank you, Lord. I, I thank you that you give us this great honor and this great privilege to be called your friends. We are humbled. We thank you that you chose us. We thank you. And we're going to give it your, our all, God. We're saying here, take. Take us, Lord. We receive you and we want you to take our heart. Teach us your ways. Instruct us, Lord. Father, I pray for grace, for friendship. Thank you, Lord, that you're signing them up again. And I feel like the Lord's saying he's taking away shame. There's no shame. There's no shame. There's no guilt. There's no condemnation. There's none of that. There's none of that. You're called to live freely in friendship. You're called to receive in friendship. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.